Hello there, back again once more, uh, back off a tablet again, hence the uh, slight decrease in picture quality. Uh, I will probably try and get some sort of HD camera in the new year if I'm going to keep doing these videos. A proper HD camcorder that is. Uh, but here today, for reals this time, I'm here to talk about the Sixth Doctor, Colin Baker. Uh, I don't know if you can hear Charlie of the Chocolate Factory in the background there. I think that's one of my neighbours enjoying a uh, post boxy Day film. That's going to be quite interesting. Well, at least we'll be some ambience in the background. Uh, Colin Baker, the Sixth Doctor. Effectively the only one of the classic series, uh, Doctors of the First Seven, who hasn't enjoyed a renaissance as part of a new series revival. Uh, but, but, but the 380s Doctors were of course the ones who for years were tweeted as crap by the BBC. Uh, but since the new series, series came back, as I talked about last time, Peter Davison has been reassessed because of there uh, being fans of his making the new Doctor Who who have uh, lauded him to the hilt. Sylvester McCoy subsequently has been reassessed uh, because he has a Hollywood career. He has managed that more successfully than David Tennant did and but it looks Matt Smith is going to. Uh, when one of the most famous directors in the world has your costume from Doctor Who in a glass cabinet in his hallway you're going to get a bit more kudos than you might have before. But Colin, on the other hand, poor old Colin, he doesn't get championed by anybody especially notable, uh, or reassessed by anybody famous or celebrated in the same way all the others have. Uh, back in the 50th anniversary, uh, Stephen Moffat did a little uh, interview thing with BBC when he talked about each of the classic Doctors, where the whole interview basically went... William Hartnell, the first, Patrick Townsend, great, John Pertwee, great, Tom Baker, great, Peter Davison, the best, Colin Baker, wasn't that special effect, but open trial of a Time Lord, really good, Sylvester McCoy, great, Paul McGann, great, Christopher Eccleston, great, David Tennant, great, and Matt Smith, great. So he was sort of about celebratory uh, moments, Paul or Colin could get a good word in. In fact, I believe the uh, BBC American, the uh, BBC America program made about the Sixth Doctor uh, for their anniversary celebrations is pretty much the only documentary to cover that period of the show's history to be unfailingly positive about everything. If you watch that, uh, you would be under the impression that the Sixth Doctor's tenure was a happy, cheerful one with no problems whatsoever. But while that probably goes too far the other way. It does make a very nice change. Uh, of course, the real question is how much of a reassessment does Colin deserve? His error, of course, was where things did go wrong for the show in terms of near cancellation, uh, in terms of that body blow being delivered. And while the McCoy era is seen as generally seen an improvement of quality, even if it is too late to save the show, uh, even Colin's biggest fans generally do acknowledge that the show had huge problems during his time on it. Uh, Colin himself, well, we all know from the Big Finish audios how good he can be. Uh, help like that, they basically reassessed and rather drastically reinvented his character. I think even much more than he's often uh, given credit for. Even I think he being older actually helps there. He's now, he's basically sort of an elderly cuddly uncle in audio form and that suits his doctor well, and his style performance much much better than the attempt to make him a uh, a bold new revisionist take of a character uh, they call it people who dislike Colin when they uh, slag him off they make criticism tend to be that he's too theatrical an actor uh, for television he's somebody who should be on the stage uh, and his performance is a suit of the TV medium. But to be frank, you know, John Pertwee was a theatrical, over-the-top actor. Tom Baker was not a subtle actor. Uh, Sylvester McCoy is a very much a theatre actor, even though he's done more film and TV work since Doctor Who and Colin has managed. Uh, theatrical, 
isn't a dirty word when it comes to being the Doctor. It's more of a sad than anything else. Only really uh, Troughton and Davison were more uh, suited to television, if, in inverted commas. And uh, yes, you know, I think Davison did handle the bad dialogue he was given better than uh, Colin handled bad dialogue he was given. But Colin had so much more bad dialogue, it's almost unfair to make that comparison. Uh, I think it would be very hard for any actor not to drown under some of the material they are given in seasons 22 and 23. And uh, personally, I like his basic performance, especially in season 22. Uh, I think he's invigorated and fresh uh, in a very Plus, with a very tired and worn out production team, he brings a lot of interesting material there. He makes a lot of stuff that shouldn't work, work very well, especially in collaboration with Nicola Bryant. Most obviously, uh, the end of the Twin Dilemma, then he has that to either the Doctor, whether you like it or not, line. Coming after a proceeding hour 40 minutes, that should make him seem like a complete utter dick. But he adds this lovely little smile that shows he's just taking a piss out of himself. And Nicola smiles back to show that she knows he's taking a piss out of himself. And it actually becomes a really nice little character moment. And one of the best bits of that story. And there's lots of stuff like that throughout his performance. Where he, as much as he you know, sometimes struggle to make uh, Pippa Jane Baker's dialogue sound remotely like something anybody would say. He still manages to make bad bits work and when he gets good bits he generally makes them work brilliantly if we've been given him more good material he'd have worked it fantastically it's just a shame he as is more usually the case with companions uh, he's having to do all the uphill work to make the character work and uh, pushing that ball up the hill it's a hell of a challenge to overcome uh, in terms of the public perception of Colin's Doctor, I think there's two things that really hurt it. One, of course, is a costume. And uh, when people talk about that costume and they're trying to defend it these days, their stock defences, it was the 80s. That does not convince me because, hey, there's nobody dressed like that in any other 80s television programme, even close. And two, everybody involved in the making of a programme except for John Nathan Turner thought the costume was a bad idea. It's not the case everybody going, on. Oh, it's just a very 80s thing. It's just a hideously terrible idea. I mean, yes, in silhouette, it's basically Paul McGann's original Doctor costume. Yeah, a bit generic in terms of a Doctor outfit. But not hideous. But the colours, they just do not work. And they especially do not see Colin's interpretation of a Doctor where he's quite an imposing physical presence. He would, now I'm sure when he talks about wearing black, he'd rather wore black leather. Well, that's a bit of retroactive thinking, I've seen Chris Freckleson. But uh, his sort of serious, more prone to anger doctor does not, well, at least I have that doctor is on television, does not suit um, the way he's dressed at all. It's a total failure on every level. And even though they suffer the character season 23, what has always amazed me since I first watched, watched Trial of the Time Lord on DVD is that according to the production notes, they had to make him a new coat for season 23 because of the uh, extra weight he put on due to suspension. So at some point, somebody thought, oh, we have to make him a new costume. Let's recreate his old costume exactly. Even though, out of all the things every people did not like about season 22, that is the easiest one we could change. It's absolutely insane. I mean, maybe, maybe JT wanted to keep it for safe for marketing reasons. I don't know, for merchandise. But even at that stage, we had a new outfit at the start of season 23. That would have done so much to help the perception of his doctor because that works against everything he's trying to do. And the other thing that works against him is, of course, how the Twin Dilemma is at the end of Peter Davison's season. Uh, it's sort of hard to introduce the new Doctor simply so the audience will be familiar with him before the ninth of weight, and then make a story about how you don't know him at all, and... Well, the moment... I mean, most of it is actually a pretty good idea. You know, regeneration is an excuse to... 
make the doctor. What's a word? To make because obviously he's normally a very confident central character of the drama, going through the trauma of regeneration, gets you the frame in a a more damaged, weaker light than you can normally do. So it can be interesting for being a bit different, uh, for uh, introducing extra elements of danger, for allowing the companion to take a good, strong, central role in a story, as they uh, have to take more of a lead and uh, their adaptation to the new lead actor. Uh, but, so there's a good idea about it. I think in the Twin Dilemma, the actual scenes in the TARDIS, with the one big exception between the Doctor and Perry, are actually very nice. Uh, Colin and Nicola play off well each other. He's having the time of his life, uh, going completely nuts with it. Uh, it's all the stuff of the twins and the slugs. And, uh, you know, frankly, you know, a couple of stories after they failed to do giant insects convincingly frontiers, what are they thinking doing giant insects again? Uh, and equally, the costumes don't work anything like the way they intended. It should have been obvious to everyone involved in the production that would be the case after the Tractator costumes could do any of the things they wanted to. Uh, that's a major failure of the giant teams right there uh, on that story. Where it all goes wrong is in the strangling. Partly because, of course, you know, it's a horrible act of male on female violence. That is incredibly disturbing to watch. And uh, yeah, if you read the novelisation by Eric Sayward, who I think had a awfully large hand in the TV version, it's even more disturbing. Yeah, the Doctor is virtually getting off on Strangling Perry in that sequence in the book. And it's... Uh, I wouldn't want to say anything is unacceptable for Doctor Who, but that really does go too far. It links in terms... Of having any hope of public sympathy returned to the Doctor, especially as, you know, these are not two old friends where she, you know, she can forgive it as a momentary aberration whilst he's going through a mental trauma, she barely knows the Doctor, despite what Big Finish have tried to convince her since. That should have ended their friendship there. I'm probably getting a lot of tweets from Admiral Turnbull now, uh, telling me off for what I'm about to say about Trial of the Time Lord. Uh, sorry about lots of interesting background noises. In this video, that's an easily important thing. And also, in the rest of the story, what it might have worked if there had been a redemptive moment for the Doctor. Uh, some moment where he saved her life specifically in a brave way, or even just flat out apologise, uh, or this something especially brave generally. But no, you know, the days effectively saved that story by his old mates falling over and having a brain farce. Uh, the Doctor's only contribution is to throw acid in the villain's face, which uh, really does, perhaps does not help to rehabilitate him. Uh, so without that, it leaves a really a pleasant taste of mouth for Strangling and seeing that I think that is something that Colin Stocks have never really recovered from. Though mind you, you know, as bad as always the Twin Dilemma is generally regarded as, the viewers came back for Attack of the yeah, that was a Thanks for the new time slot and uh, being back on Saturdays and promotional push. Lots of people going to see Attack of Cybermen. If that had been a really good story, any problems from Twin Dilemma could have been overcome quite easily. It'd be like, it'd be like Robot. Robot is a bit of a rubbish Tom Baker story. Uh, but then you had the Ark in Space. Attack of Cybermen, unfortunately, is also terrible. Uh, I don't think some of the things he has accused of are slightly unfair. Uh, it generally explains the relationship to its old stories reasonably well. Uh, I think you wouldn't have any trouble actually following the Cybermen plot because it's spoiled out his basics if you had to see the old stories. Uh, but equally, I don't think it's especially interesting. And it does mean the story sort of stops in the middle in the TARDIS so the Doctor and Lisa and Brian Glover and Perry can have a conversation explaining the backstory that kills on momentum. I mean, it's, it's just not a very interesting story. Uh, you have what will become an Eric Sayward, Sayward trademark with the two characters who have a huge chunk of a plot about how anything to do with it. Uh, there's a struggle with a 45-minute format. It's, it's just a bad start 
to the season. I just the 45 minute format, the one thing that puzzles me about that is, is often talk about how hard it was for them to adjust to it. But 45 minutes was by then a standard TV episode length. And certainly, you know, Doctor Who's four twenty-five minutes serial format, that was becoming more and more anachronistic as the 80s went on. Uh, that was the aberration, you know, in terms of television, there's really no excuse for any writer not being able to handle a 45 minute episode, whether it's for a show that had done 45 minute episodes before or not. And uh, so, I think the blame for that is with Saywood, because of other writers for that season uh, who are team. Uh, Glenn McClory had written for a 45 minute show before, that had been his only other television experience. Uh, Philip Martin was a very experienced TV writer. Robert Holmes had done 45 minute episodes of things before. Saywood hadn't, and I think when you talk about what is wrong with the Colin Baker era, most of it comes back to Saywood. And I think there was a very good point made on uh, the TARDIS. I've never heard this word said out loud, so it's bad to get this wrong. Era, tour, era, era. The Philip Sanderford blog, there's a great uh, throw it, he makes talking about Saywood. He points out the guy went from writing his first ever television script with a visitation to being script editor of Doctor Who in one fell swoop. And I like the visitation, but that's clearly far too fast to move, uh, to go from just learning your craft of writing television to being in charge of helping other writers get their scripts into shape. And that, the visitation is a script that says, do, have him do a couple of, one or two stories a year under the tutelage of a more experienced script editor, and then you know, he could be in a position to step into the big shoes because he does show promise with, promise with that first script. Uh, but he doesn't have the experience. And I know Andrew Cartmel hadn't done much before when he takes over, but equally he'd been on a, a BBC script writing and editing course that was simply about training you for that sort of thing. So you know, he, he didn't have a real world experience, but he was much more grounded in the basics. And that gives him a much more solid footing when he comes onto the show, which Saywood just doesn't have. And uh, that hurts the, f the fact they're writing in 45 minutes now, because Saywood has no idea how to do that, because he's never done it before, even though it's a standard TV thing. Uh, if you ever followed with Saywood at this point, of course, other than his increasingly deteriorating relationship with JNT, is that he does not like Colin Baker as an actor. And that is lethal. Uh, you get the Doctor increasingly uninvolved in the plots, you get the Doctor increasingly, increasingly unsympathetic way. I mean, Revelation of Daleks is great, and it would have been a perfect departure point for Saywood after screwing up the rest of the season, uh, but it's great in spite of the Doctor, not because of him, he's almost irrelevant to it. I only got a, you know, a theatrical central actor like Colin Baker, who is very good at dominating scenes, that is really not using him to his best ability. It does, doesn't work, and it happens too often. There are too many stories where they don't leave the TARDIS until far too long into it. There are too many stories where it is clear that the script editor has had enough. Maybe him disliking the lead man wouldn't be so much of a problem if we're talking about a large ensemble cast, but there are only two regular characters. Effectively, Eric Saywood hates 50% of the main cast of Doctor Who in season 22. And when Bonnie Langford becomes cast in season 23, he hates 100% of the cast. That is understandably a disaster. Uh, really, once the point an actor he disliked and he thought would not work was cast, he should have left. And yes, you know, he's a freelancer, you don't know where your next job's going to come from. It's understandable why he chose to say. But that doesn't make the end result of the script he was involved in after that any better. Uh, he does a hell of a lot of harm to the show in this period. Of course, J John Nathan Turner is also headed for a lot of burnout at this point. There's a, most of the really bad decisions John Nathan Turner makes during his time with the show and made during this period. Uh, it started with the costume, so it's equally arguable, arguable that he should have left as well. 
Uh, the main circumstances in favour of him staying, other than nobody else wanted to do the job, and the fact that nobody else would actually manage when getting the show main side of the things better than he did, is that we know that after season 23, he obviously stepped back, had a think, realised he was stuck with the show, and reinvented and uh, re-energised himself. So over the last three years, are much, much better. And it would be a shame to lose that. Uh, if So I would say, yes, John Lefferts should have stayed during Colin's time, despite uh, the poor mistakes he makes uh, during that period. Uh, rest of season 22, Vengeance of Varos is uh, probably the best story. Uh, it's a lot especially great, but it's uh, got some nice ideas. Fits 45 minutes episodes better than uh, most of the other writers manage. The violence, as it turns out, the satire generally works. So this is where you get to sort of problem with Collins' era. It turns out being... You know, Do Eric Sayer was always treated Doctor as an action hero. Uh, often a gun toasted action hero. That's what it works in terms of keeping the character do appropriately doctorish with Peter Davison, who was sort of this fey looking, weedy English bloke who was completely unconvincing as an action hero, so that almost makes it interesting. But Colin, as ludicrous as costume is, Colin has an imposing physical presence. He's a big guy, and in season 22, he's lean and mean. He looks like he could knock down most of the bad guys with one hard punch. Uh, which makes the strangling into the twin dilemma even more terrifying because he's such a big, strong bloke. I mean, all the previous Doctors, you know, even Pertwee, every time he talked to him in action scene, he just looks funny because he's such a... Again, you know, they thought they were doing serious action scenes there, but he just looks ludicrous. And Tom, who's also a big guy, uh, is a gangly bloke. You know, he looks... He doesn't look threatening with it because of his slope and his uh, weirdness. Colin looks scary with right framing and shooting, and that hurts a lot of scene. Like Yasimath scene, we mentioned some hours. Now, yes, he does not push the guy in, but he looks like he's trying to push that guy in hard before the other guy grabs him. And, yeah, the Doctor should not look more terrified than the villain, uh, more terrifying than the villains. Uh, the same with the two Doctors, uh, the shock eyes death, uh, that, well, that's a direction fail. I imagine in the script what's supposed to be happening there is a vicious, deadly life of dead death hunts where a ble slowly bleeding to death Doctor weakening is forced to use lethal violence as a desperate last act against an overpowering foe. We've got big, strong looking Colin Baker. Versus a little fat old ginger bloke who doesn't look like he'd stand a chance against Colin. Colin looks like he could just, even with a leg wound, completely just knock him out. There's no need to use cyanide or shock eye in that scene. There's no tension or real energy to the scene either, so it doesn't feel that urgent. So it just, what well, body wasn't in Robert Holmes's mind... As a despicable act of a doctor winds up feeling like one. And that's, um, in season 23, where Colin's actually got a bit of extra weight on him, even it makes him, he looks slightly unhealthy, you know, he actually looks in better health in dimensions in time a few years later with the shorter hair and uh, the leaner face. But the extra yeah, weight does weirdly make a difference in making him seem more cuddly and lovable and less scary. As he can actually often come across in season 22. Uh, so, sort of the, the writing, coupled with his physicality, hurts what they're trying to do in that season. Uh, arguably, that's why also he's better in Big Finish, because his voice is age, so he sounds more like an elderly, livable uncle uh, than he does in the TV series, and uh, that creates a different mood of feel as well, even if uh, the covers and the uh, Chronology is trying to make you think of him as he looked at the time. Uh, have you ever saw these? Uh, Vegas of Aros has a uh, Mark of a Rally, rather. So my skill there has a solid enough plot. 
Uh, but his hamstring by Pippa Jane Baker's dialogue. And I know people chop you over dialogue saying how great it is that uh, they're not talking down to the viewers. I know Colin Baker's very much of opinion as well. He likes uh, the dialogue they gave him. But to be fair, his doctor is a character it suits because he's very verbose. The problem is, they're too busy thinking about how they can use impressive and impressive words and they're not thinking about how people talk. And everybody in all their stories, except when they do a comedy northerner uh, that comes out rather disastrously, uh, everyone talks in exactly the same way. Whether you're a uh, Time Lord or a computer programmer for Beast Possage or a, a, a hard pressed starship captain, you just use all this waffle and it's awful. And but pretty much none of the actors except Colin can actually manage to say it properly. Uh, they clearly have no idea what the hell they're going on about. It is cringy juicy. And uh, yeah, I've, I, I've certainly heard Bonnie Langford when she joins the show that uh, almost half her episodes are written by these two people uh, who have no idea how to write for a contemporary young woman from 1987. It's. Uh, just awful to listen to, really. Uh, the other story's time lash is weird because it's awful, but it's also strangely prescient in that it is the same basic script as all the celebrity writer historicals are in the new series. You know, the Dickens, the Shakespeare, the Christie, uh, all getting wrapped up in a story with a doctor that ironically reflects the contents of their work, it even has the idea from the Shakespeare and the Christie episodes that these writers aren't actually talented at all, they just nicked all their idea from a shit Doctor Who episode that they got involved in instead. Uh, it's a slightly odd implication in stories that are meant to be celebrating these authors, uh, I've always thought, but it's fair. Uh, two Doctors, far too long, far too badly directed, Terrible Sontaran costumes, and uh, Patrick Troughton and uh, Fraser Hines play off Colin and Nicola very well. It's kind of, it's kind of a shame that Troughton looks so old and haggard, and in that one, especially if he'd been in a wheelchair for most of it, he looked. I mean, I, I have no problem with returning doctors looking older than we did at the time. I think that's a conceit anybody with any sense is happy to accept when watching multi doctor stories. Yeah, you just wink and turn a blind eye to it. Uh, but considering he looked fine in the Five Doctors just a couple of years earlier, it, just, it feels like you're watching somebody nearly the end of their life, and that makes it oddly melancholic and uh, almost a bit uncomfortable at times when they're preparing, preparing to perform surgery on him. Um, even though, know, with him not being looking in the best of health, he still seals every scene that he's in. Uh, that is easily the best thing in that story, yeah. And as I said before, Revelation is the best story of the season. You can't call it the best Co Colin Baker story uh, because he's barely in it. Uh, Turnbull's getting really angry now as uh, he knows what he's coming in a minute. Uh, but uh, it works as a story in and of itself and it's great fun. Try the Time Lord up. But well, they had 18 months. They knew they had to do things differently. They basically did nothing differently apart from change the theme tune and decide to shoot the show on, all on video. I mean, on the documentary, uh, say we're talking about going to the office and doing nothing for months on end. Like, Dear God, you should be working on this if you decide to save the show. And you know you've really got to do something to turn it round. You don't sit there waiting for Jonathan Powell to tell you what you need to do, you start coming up with ideas there and then, if you're going to use this, try and save your career as a script editor. Uh, now John Nathan Turner was a bit lackadaisical about score as well, but at least he was, seems to be doing more stuff during the 18 months in terms of uh, getting the show ready for production than saying what seems to have done in terms of getting the show ready for writing. And so you end up with this weird situation where they decide to do a 14-part story where the first 12 parts are being written by people... Well, no, I was assuming Robert Hope knew I was going to mention some uh, eight 
of the first 12 parts are being written by people who have no idea how the story's going to end. So the people who wrote part 12 are brought into like part 14, they have no idea what was supposed to happen in part 14, even though they were supposed to be building up to it. It's a complete, unmitigated disaster as an attempt to do an overall season arc. Uh, they spend far too many, much money on an opening spaceship station shot, so a lot of the other visual effects of the season look quite poor, especially in terms of the fur uh, The spaceship shots in that look awful. You have a crap, cheap and nasty looking trial set where this actually takes place on. You have a villain, but nobody can agree on who he actually is, and they badly compromise that at the end. It's, it's almost a shame that they didn't actually make him the 13th Doctor, because you know that uh, when they came to time of the Doctor, Stephen Moffat would have done something with that. However, a blinkling, uh, he's that much of a mad fanboy. So all the framing device does not work. Of the individual stories, Mysterious Planet is okay. It rehashes a lot of older ideas for Holmes is, but it's uh, watchable. Mind Warp, it looks great. You know, actually, what Freddy's on the season does look great consistently with the use of paint box and having some fun with that. It's nice to have Sil back, who is a great villain, even though his costume actually isn't as good as it was in his first story. And the ending is brilliant. And you know, Perry's death, unlike Andrick's death, is actually urged by the story because for the trial to work, for there's any doubts about the outcome, you need to see the Doctor fail, and for the Doctor to fail badly. And the death of per Perry... It doesn't quite work because she only dies because they drag him out of time, so that's a slight uh, cock up there. It would be better if it would be more directly his responsibility. But yeah, that is a massive failure on his part. The trial si asks if the Doctor... Uh, the Sixth Doctor is a failure, and my warp finds him wanting. Now that brings in all sorts of angles of jeopardy and tension that otherwise wouldn't be there and otherwise aren't there in the rest of the trial. You know, if you're going to kill a regular character, that is how you do it. So it matters and it has consequences in a way that Andrew Steph didn't. Uh, it's not just a publicity stunt or a cheap gimmick. It is something essential to the story that the story absolutely needed for the whole season to work. And then they undo it at the very end, and... The revelation of Perry wound up marrying a violent, shouting man, uh, whose first impulse is to punch anyone who disagrees with him. Oh yeah, there are people who find a subtext in Perry's character that she keeps saying into horribly abusive relationships with men. Uh, implications about her stepfather, implications about her relationship with the Sixth Doctor, all those aliens who lust after her in a violent, disturbing way, culminating in a marriage to a violent psychopath. Uh, I'd say there's not really enough thought put into Perry's character to make it worth thinking about these things in any depth. Uh, and it's just a shame that they could lie to again, you know, made bad material much better than it ever needed to be, rather than it ever deserved to be, had that horribly record ending of one of her finest moments. Uh, but yeah, that's not my warp's fault. Still a pretty enjoyable story on its own merits. Furoids has that Pip and J problem, okay plot, terrible dialogue, uh, and this. The idea of him presenting a story from his future as his defence. I mean, it's weird. We have the first story of the season with the prosecution's case against him. Is the Doctor saving the entire universe from destruction? While the Doctor's case him to his defence, is him committing genocide? How does that work? How is it being a story from his future work? I mean, if, they, if he said, you know, this is something I will do if you let me go, and it's a possible future... That would be fair enough, but that is not the implication of dialogue, that's obviously not what anybody thinks. Uh, does he go off and have a Vevoid adventure at the end? There's a weird thing at the end of the trial, they've accused him of genocide. He is guilty of future genocide. They, let, they release him, it's, it's 
Bizarre, especially as it also turns out his future self is a mad psychopath. Uh, they executed him would probably be in the best interest of everybody at that point, even beyond his guilt of genocide. Uh, he's just got no coherence or cohesion to it, and yes, I would say what le left. I uh, wouldn't let his last script get used with a cliffhanger ending. Obviously, knowing that was going to be Colin's last story, ending on a cliffhanger could have actually led more neatly into the arrival of Sylvester. He could have just come out of the time at the start of the next scenes and gone, Phew, uh, had to regenerate. Uh, but equally, of course, they're looking for reasons to just drop the show quietly at this point. The only reason Doctor Who gets made for the next three years is apathy. Uh, so they could well have used a, is he dead, a cliffhanger to go, yep, yeah, he's dead. Uh, so I think JT was pretty much right there. I uh, like, I mean, after doing a 14 part story, that you needed an ending to it. You know, not necessarily a happy ending, but a coherent and conclusive ending. Uh, well, and it's not terribly coherent, though, that is a problem, uh, but it undoes it. Uh, it's just a mess of story, mess of a production, enjoyable moments here and there, and enjoyable second segments aren't enough to save it. Uh, Body Langford, of course. It could have been the Billy Piper, you know. She could have been the Billy Piper of her day. Uh, very talented actress, famous beforehand, yes. But she's good enough that if they'd given her good material, she could have been a great character. But what they do instead, and why she isn't quite able to overcome the material, as well as previous companions have been able to, everybody's writing, not for Mel, the computer programmer for Pete's Pottage, they are writing for what they think Body Langford is like. And that gives her nowhere to go with it, except play it like how you think Body Langford is right. So everyone who, when her casting was announced, went, oh dear God, I know exactly what Body Langford in Doctor Who is going to be like, was vindicated. It's as if uh, everyone who was writing the first season of the new series had written Billy uh, Rose as somebody who likes to do pop songs and shag old ginger men. Uh, it wouldn't have worked, however good an actor actress Billy Piper is. So that really hurts Melly, as does most of the episodes be written by Pip and Jane. Uh, we know from the audios and from uh, getting into some other writers in season 24, that Body Langford can do good things, even though the basic weakness of Mel's character is something they've not quite been able to overcome completely in Big Finish. Uh, so it's just a shame she's so badly served here. Uh, it's just a complete and utter mess. So, yeah, oh, Colin's last lines as well. Now, of course, and they say, you know, they didn't know it was his last story, so we didn't know the carrot juice, carrot juice, carrot juice was going to be the last thing he was ever going to say. But equally, you know, the show was on the brink of cancellation. This could well have been the last ever season of Doctor Who, the last ever episode of Doctor Who. That would have been the last ever line of dialogue in a Doctor Who episode. Uh, even without the name, he would be sacked if it came back. There was still a very real chance that would be Colin's last moments on screen. That, that was somebody sat there for, you know, the last ever line ever in Doctor Who, if the show gets cancelled, what that should be is carrot juice, carrot juice, carrot juice. Uh, it's just insane that that happened. Uh, so, Colin's tenure, a good actor, a good doctor. Badly let down by so many of the people around him. Uh, especially the script editor. That was a, just something that was never ever going to end well. And it's such a shame that he is so much still the shit one outside of fandom. Yeah, fandom have come around to him for two reasons. First, he has never walked away from Doctor Who. Uh, it would have be been perfectly understandable if he said, fuck it. Because, you know, him being sat like that, uh, the reaction to his time in the show basically killed his TV career. Uh, but he's always done conventions, he's always done interviews, he's always spoke kindly and proudly of his association with the show. He's never seemed bitter and twisted about what happened to him. 
that in jury of a show, and he's been a fantastic ambassador for the series. I know with uh, Tom Baker for so long, not wanting anything to do with the series, and uh, Peter Davison, perhaps wisely in terms of avoiding typecasting and maintaining his career, uh, being quite distant from it as well for a while, often uh, speaking not terribly kindly of it, Colin has, for quite a long time, basically been the main ambassador for the series, and he has done it with a great deal of style and aplomb, and that is great credit to him. Uh, and here, of course, is a big finish audios, where you get some of the very best Doctor Who ever made, and his Doctor is in it. Uh, so these fans love and embrace him much more than they did at the time, when they were all lined up with their big pointy knives. I'm probably doing a lot more harm for the show than good, with uh, some of the more eccentric moments. But as far as you know, people don't listen to Big Finish or pay attention to documentaries and interviews are concerned, he's a shit one. And that is such a tragedy. Uh, I would have loved to see what he could have done with Andrew Cartmell as script editor. Yeah, as much as I'm a Sylvester McCoy child, as much as I would, wouldn't want to change anything about those last three seasons, if we'd have a chance to work with the next script editor, a script editor whose idea of a doctor seems to basically be in very much in line with what Colin wanted to do with it anyway, but never quite came off during his time, that could have been some really good stuff. And that could have well rehabilitated him in the eyes of the general public for those last three years. Sadly not to be. Uh, but you know, if, if you've not seen a Colin Baker story, if you're prepared to... Go into it with an open mind, based on the fact that everything was going to hell behind the scenes. There are a lot of things to like and to enjoy. Uh, there's one outright classic in Revelation. Uh, most of the others are at least entertainingly watchable in a sort of mildly naff 80s TV way. But there's no real, real way of hiding it. Uh, Despite the best efforts of Colin Baker, of Nicola Bryant, of Bonnie Langford, of uh, Graham Harper on the direction, uh, of some of the special effects people, the makeup, uh, the Borad, you know, however shit Time Lash is, the Borad is a fantastic costume. What a shame he's wasted a story like that. Uh, despite all that, this is the most problematic era of Doctor Who ever. It is the era where it nearly died, it is the era it never properly recovered from. But ultimately that is uh, the low points, for what a better word. From now on things will be up and up. Things are going to start getting better. And I am actually looking forward to watching Time of Rally tomorrow. Oh yes, not many people will say that. So, join me in a few weeks for my uh, Swiss McCoy video. I hope, uh, well, I hope uh, there are enough people who will survive me talking about Time of Rani when I come round to it, because I'm going to say uh, some very nice things about that story. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm off to have a nice glass of carrot juice. Carrot juice. Carrot juice.